grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's gospel has to do with what theologians sometimes call the exclusive claim of Christ. This is the fact that Jesus Christ claims to be the only way of salvation. Many Christians, including those in the Lutheran Church, assert this doctrine based on various statements of Jesus throughout the Gospels, including today's Gospel lesson. Strive to enter through the narrow door, Jesus says. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. This was Jesus' answer to the question, Lord, will those who are being saved be few? One of the great matters of religious discussion is how many people will be saved and, and what must they do to be saved? Strive to enter through the narrow door, Jesus says. And the question at hand is really just how much ajar is that door? Throughout the history of Christianity, many people have proposed various answers to the question posed to Jesus. Lord, will those who are saved be few? And the answers of question of Christians in the camp of John Calvin, which includes the Reformed Church and Presbyterians, is that yes, very few people will be saved because God only sent Jesus to redeem the elect. For them, election is the doctrine by which God chooses some people to be saved and most people to be damned. Formally, this is sometimes called the doctrine of double predestination. But if you ask me, it sure as hell sounds like double jeopardy. And I do mean sure as hell, because unless you are one of those special elect, you are damned destined for hell and eternal destruction. And in this system, there's not a thing that you and I can say or do about it. Calvinists will point to various places in Scripture to support their take on election. For instance, they point to passages like Romans 8 and Ephesians 1, which speak of our salvation in terms of predestination. He, God, predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. And those whom He predestined, He also called... And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I do have to point out, though, that these talk about how those who are saved are predestined for salvation. It doesn't say anything about those being damned be pre being predestined for damnation. But of particular importance for this discussion is Romans 9, in which the Apostle Paul tries to show how the chosen people Israel could possibly reject and deny Christ. He actually takes a cue from Old Testament history and the fact that God chose Jacob to be the patriarch of the promised people instead of his older twin brother, Esau. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The same chapter speaks of some people as vessels of wrath destined for destruction, and others as vessels of mercy prepared for glory. In other words, from the beginning of the time, God supposedly chooses a select few people to be saved and determines that everyone else will go to hell. All of this is contrived as support for the overarching theme of Calvin's theology, which is the sovereignty of God. The idea that at all else, we must maintain that God is absolutely in control of everything. And they will do something to maintain God's awesome glory even at the expense of His amazing grace. But the trouble with Calvin's theology is that it makes a liar out of God. It makes it seem as though God is capricious, as though God is out to get us. It turns God into our enemy instead of our Savior. And it assumes that God's grace is not intended for every person on the planet. And yet Scripture clearly teaches otherwise. Everyone's favorite Bible verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus doesn't say, God so loves Calvin and Chris and a small handful of special people. No, the, the Bible says, God so loved the world. It means God so loved everyone that he gave his only son. And that includes you and me. There are other important passages in Scripture that affirm the idea that the door is open. And in 1 Timothy, Paul writes, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires all people to be saved. St. Peter says the same thing in a slightly different way. The Lord is not slow to keep His promises, as some count slowness, 
Lord is patient toward you, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God does not want anyone to be damned. He wants rather that people should repent and be saved. Every single person who ever lived on the face of the earth is near and dear to God's heart. He is the maker and the father of all. And he does not delight in the death of a sinner. He doesn't want his children to die apart from a relationship with him. What then of that Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9? Well, you know, the whole thing about Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. When you read that chapter in its entirety and in its full context, what you realize is it's not so much trying to show how God is particular and only goes for elite, but it's used to show how God's grace expands from the Jewish people to the entire race of humanity, including the Gentiles. And the passages of I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I will have compassion is not trying to indicate that somehow God is limiting his compassion and mercy, but rather to show how abundant his mercy and his compassion truly are. For this reason, another group has arisen in Christianity known as universalists. And universalists will pick up on these wonderful Bible verses I just read, and they'll say, isn't this wonderful? God wants everyone to be saved, and so this must mean that everyone will be saved, right? After all, how is it possible for God to not get what God wants? Don't put God in a box. He's too big. He's too gracious for them. The Bible says that God is love, and how could a loving God ever allow someone to go to hell? The only loving conclusion, they insist, is that everyone is saved, regardless of whether or not they claim to be a Christian, regardless of whether or not they believe in Jesus, regardless of whether or not they follow Christ or some other God or religious leader. And I must admit, this is a very appealing concept, certainly more appealing than Calvinism. Many of us wonder about the final destination of our loved ones who died apart from faith in Christ. And most of us worry about the faith of our neighbors who are Jewish or Mormon or Muslim. It's comforting to think that they'll be saved too, even if they don't believe in the Christ of Scriptures. But no wonder then that in recent years, many famous Christian pastors and theologians and writers have been taken in by this false teaching of universalism. In Vatican II, the Catholic theologian Karl Rahner insisted there must be room for the concept of the so-called anonymous Christian, meaning that people who practice other religions, even if they don't know Christ, as long as they practice their religion sincerely, their service to their God must be viewed as service to the one true God. Of course, this turns grace into works righteousness. Rob Bell, the founding pastor of Mars Hill, a huge megachurch in Grand Rapids, Michigan, insists that in the end, love wins. And love wins means that nobody has to go to hell. And even that favorite writer of many evangelicals, C.S. Lewis, whom I also appreciate many of his writings, but even Lewis left the door open and hinted at the possibility that even unbelievers might be saved. The ancient church father origin went so far as to speculate But maybe even Satan and the demons might be saved in the end. Perhaps the vacancy signs in hell will be permanently lit for eternity. What universalists maintain above all else is that God is kind and generous. And on that point, they're correct. They do that at the expense of his justice. In the Old Testament, God's character is described as gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, And in the parables of Jesus, God is described as a merciful father, prodigal in grace, a good Samaritan who helps everyone in need, a generous landlord who pays the workers of the vineyard the same amount, regardless of whether they started at 6 in the morning or 5 o'clock at night. Truly, God is love. But unfortunately, universalism is false comfort. In the mystery of God's love, he will not force you to go to heaven. If you don't want to have a relationship with God, if you don't want to be in His heaven, He won't make you go there. And if you reject His Son, and if you refuse to believe His promises, you can go to hell. Literally. The Bible is quite clear that you will be damned if you do not have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it may not be popular to say in our pluralistic, tolerant, 
spiritual but not religious society. And yet the reality is not what people want to hear. In the same passage of Paul's letter to Timothy, where we hear that God wants all people to be saved, in the very next verse, verse 5, he adds, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is one mediator between God and men, Jesus. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Mary, Jesus. Just Jesus. And as Peter preached in Acts 4, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And despite that saying that there's one mountain and many paths, there is truly only one way to heaven. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ himself claimed to be the only way of salvation. Jesus told his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and broad is the path that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. It sounds a lot like the parable in our Gospel from Luke, where Jesus says, Strive to enter through the narrow door. Where many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus is the only way to be saved. He's not one of many paths to enlightenment. He is the only way. Buddha will not save you. Allah will let you down. Mary is of no help. If you turn away from Christ, if you reject his invitation, if you resist his grace, he will have one thing to say to you on that final day of judgment, and it will be, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And then you will be cast into the outer darkness, the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't like that. But who am I to argue with Jesus? I don't make the rules. But I believe them. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. And yet God, in his mercy, does not want you to be damned. Remember that God desires that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God does not want to give us what we deserve for our sins. He loves you and he only wants to rescue you. That's why he sent his son Jesus to be your Savior. To be the way and the truth and the light. And to show that way through the cross and the empty tomb. In our gospel lesson, Jesus urges, strive to enter through the narrow door. Now that door may be narrow, but the door is open. The door is narrow, but the door is open. Because Jesus is the door. In the book of Revelation, Jesus declares, Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. And in John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. And whoever enters by me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door. And the door is narrow because Jesus is the only way through it. But the door is open because God wants everyone to be saved. The door is open to all, because no matter what you've done or haven't done in your life, no matter who you are, the door is open for you. And until the day that you die, or the day that Christ returns, whichever happens first, the door is open. But someday the door will shut. And then it will be too late. And then it will be too late to say, let me in, let me in, right now. Christ holds that door open in invitation with the same arms with which he spread open on the cross to show his love for you, his love for the world. He tried to enter through the narrow door. Enter through Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.